So with this beautiful energy at the room, we will talk energy. Investment in the energy sector is a crucial for a stable and sustainable supply and drive economic growth and job creation worldwide. So now let's explore the pivotal role played by the Gulf nation in shaping the global energy landscape and a transition into clean, sustainable energy. Hosting the COP28 in the UAE this year symbolized the unwavering trust that the global community has in the region. The prestigious event not only recognized the UAE's commitment to tackle climate change, but also highlights, but also highlights the significant effort maybe, uh, made uh, by the entire region in fostering sustainability and, and taking uh, the leadership in the energy transition investments, a clean uh, tech and low carbon solution. So what are the opportunities and challenges of this transformative journey in the Gulf region and how the French expertise is standing out? So now I will introduce uh, our moderator, Marc-Antoine uh, Il Mezega, si je prononce bien, je suis désolé, <laughs> Director Energy and Climate Center, French Institute for International Relations. So I invite you to start uh, the panel with your esteemed guest. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to moderate this uh, crucial panel. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers. And a, and a challenge. It's like the energy transitions. We have to speed up, so we will also speed up this panel. But I'd like to give you, I think, just to set the scene in a few words, to tell you that there is, of course, no uh, global energy security these days and for the foreseeable future without the fundamental contribution from the GCC countries, and especially in oil supply flexibility. Now, there will be no global <clears throat> energy security, no global economic security, and no global security full stop if we do not accelerate low carbon technology investments. And uh, the good news is there's a lot happening in the GCC. There's incredible opportunities. These are technologies that are available that can make money. And what we need to look for is how do we basically manage the uh, uh, imperative of energy security, of affordability, of public acceptance, of sustainability, but also, of course, competitiveness and, and, and the, the value chain uh, mastering. So this is a, a, a few words from my side. Um, we uh, have, a, as I said, a, a good mixture of uh, stakeholders from the GCC and from uh, France and Europe. So I'd like to start uh, this conversation uh, in, in calling uh, Mr. Nabil Al-Nuaim. You are the Aramco Digital CEO and Aramco Senior Vice President for Digital and IT. And, and I think um, uh, it is not a change that you are here. I think it really reflects the fundamental transformation of uh, your company, which makes headlines because it is one of the most, if not the most profitable company in the world but actually also a, a definite leader in, in this uh, digital transformation. So uh, the floor is yours. Tell us a bit uh, what's moving you every day. Uh, maybe uh, I would like to start framing uh, my comments into uh, uh, like supply, demand, when you talk about energy, but also you know, what are the enabling technologies, what are the enabling you know, policies and regulations, and also uh, investment. So when we talk about, uh, at least in, in Aramco, the way we put our strategy, including digital, uh, by the way, one of the objectives of digital is really to strengthen Saudi Aramco position in climate change, as an example. Uh, so when you talk about supply, we have to t talk about supply in the form of uh, you know, conventional energy being the most secure, most affordable energy, but also plan for the energy transition. Energy transition in the form of other forms of energy renewables, you know, the new energy like hydrogen, um, but also, uh, you know, gas. Uh, at the same time, low carbon solutions for the conventional energy. So this is from the supply side. From the demand, you know, uh, when you consume energy, also there is a role for uh, the consumers, whether industrial, residential, you know, or, or uh, uh, commercial. So energy efficiency is a big component as well. 
uh, from the demand side. And as we know, uh, uh, the energy is also consumed uh, in the form of materials. So when we talk about energy uh, transition, we should talk about also transitioning to new materials from, from uh, uh, commodities like, like the oil. Uh, and, and there are uh, projects and initiatives that Aramco is doing, what we call it non-metallic, transitioning into more, into material that is more sustainable, has a lower carbon footprint. At the same time, from investment, when you talk about sustainability, which is really uh, uh, put uh, uh, all the, uh, the whole framework all together and compensate the, uh, the whole thing, is we, Aramco, we launched what we call sustainability fund, a $1.5 billion fund that focuses on providing disruptive emerging technology to, to help and support sustainability from the supply side, from the demand side, uh, and, and also uh, with our material in the uh, solving material transition issues or energy transition issues. So when we talk about, you know, what's really happening in the region, you will find almost that we have the same story. And uh, being the, the most, uh, you know, or, or the most secure and reliable and affordable supply of energy that comes from the GCC countries, uh, being Aramco, the global player over there, we always look at the whole, the whole picture together. And this is what uh, uh, the way we'll, we really uh, are excited about the, uh, the time. And also we are excited of our relationship with France. You know, we have a very long you know, historical business relationship with France. Um, you know, we, at least in Aramco, we invested in, in a couple of new technology companies that really addresses almost the, what I'm talking about. So, uh, so happy to be part of the team. We hope we identify uh, some of the technologies and the companies that we can invest in that really looks at the whole picture uh, altogether. Thank you very much uh, for these uh, introductory points. Uh, and um, I may now turn to, to your neighbor, Hervé Maillard, who is the permanent delegate for the nuclear sector uh, of the Strategic Committee for the Nuclear Sector in France. So he plays a key coordinator role. As you know, France is the country of nuclear power, but uh, we see also many developments in the GCC area, and uh, you are very active there. Uh, perhaps you could tell us more about uh, your perspectives and, uh, and uh, how you see uh, things going on. Yes, so I, I would like to, to insist on the fact that to the energy transition will require in the next decades uh, a huge increase of low carbon energy. It's quite easy to decarbonize the, the electricity with uh, solar power, with uh, windmills, with nuclear. So we will probably face an, a huge increase of electricity. If I take just a value in France, if we want to decarbonize uh, heating for buildings, individuals and collective, we will face exactly around the same energy consumption that the electricity production in France, the same level of energy that we will need. So uh, I'm sure that uh, nuclear energy will play an important role in the future. Uh, you, you know, you all know that uh, UAE has already started uh, three reactors and will start the fourth one in the next uh, weeks. <laughs> Um, uh, and I will insist on three very important points for nuclear. Uh, nuclear is cost effective because uh, the, the price of the electricity produced is due to 60% to the capital. So once we start the, the nuclear power, the price is very stable for a long term, 60 years and very uh, low compared to uh, the market of other uh, energy. It's controllable, so you can follow uh, solar panels or the wind production, and it's very effective uh, concerning resources consumption, the, the ground, very effective for the space on the ground, the concrete, the steel, the mining consumption. So, France is one of the leaders uh, for nuclear technology. We had some problem in the past. Uh, okay, we will uh, now we are on the road to to to, to go um, for a new 
launch of uh, six plus eight uh, new construction of reactor in France. So we will need a lot of talents. So it was mentioned uh, earlier. Um, and I will, would like to say that we have created, it was mentioned by Mr. Saint-Martin at the beginning of this conference, we have created with the Emirates an initiative called eFusion. And uh, we have created, I am responsible for this initiative, and we have created it in uh, 2019 with the objective, in fact, to, to build some collaboration between nuclear French uh, industry and, at this time, non-nuclear Emirati industry. So uh, today we have uh, approximately 50 uh, French companies uh, participating to this initiative, and we, are, uh, we have approximately uh, 25 Emirati companies building some collaboration, building some contracts to uh, work in the Baraka nuclear power plant. We have some big contracts, some big success. Uh, it's a very effective organization. We organize several meetings each year. Um, and uh, I think it's a good example of uh, what can France do in this uh, field of nuclear with other countries, because uh, Baraka is not a French technology, it's a Korean technology, but we can work uh, with different technology. And I will insist uh, to conclude on the fact that this, um, this organization has a very high in-country value. It's not France that sells some hundreds or thousands of people to work at Baraka. No, the value is really an in-country value and the French technology, French companies bring their knowledge, but don't bring uh, so much value uh, back in France. You know, it's really an in-country value in the Emirates. Thank you, uh, Hervé, and uh, we'll continue uh, with the electricity sector um, 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 and the opportunities there. I'm talking to, to Brice Rezin, you are the Vice President of Heavy Duty Gas Turbine Sales for G Gas Power Europe, Middle East and Africa, and uh, you operate, uh, you are one of the global uh, leaders in this technology uh, supply chain, and you operate notably a big, big factory in Belfort, uh, which is a, a, an industrial region a cluster in France, which could turn into also a major, by the way, a hydrogen hub uh, moving forward. So perhaps you could tell us how, how you see the future of your activities in the region and how that could enable to combine sustainability and energy security. Yes, and thank you and good morning, everybody. So, you know, when you think about power gen, first of all, power generation is about one third of uh, CO2 emission in the world. So that's the type of responsibility of the stakeholder of the sector have today. Uh, secondly, when you think about the transition, you realize, everybody realizes that there is a trilemma. A trilemma be between uh, affordability of power, Nabil spoke about it, uh, reliability and dispatchability of power, uh, and sustainability of power. This is all, and, and everybody in the industry have to work inside this trilemma, thinking about the roadmap with this trilemma in mind. Now there is an extra one that, that we had to it, that is energy security, that, you also spoke about. So, you know, that's a game board. When you think about energy transition in power, in power generation, that's what you have to think about. Now, uh, how we think uh, and how GCC is handling that, which is very in line on how we think about it, is that ultimately for the transition, the couple of renewable energy with gas power is the right answer. It's the right answer for several reasons. First. Uh, it allows to uh, get to the target we have, we all have. It allows to get the energy securities. Um, it also allows to ensure that the investment are done in technology, and I'm speaking specifically about the gas power technology, that are able to decarbonize in the future or now with carbon capture technology, I'm, I'm sure other st stakeholders will speak about that, and hydrogen, because gas power technology is a technology that is able to burn hydrogen. To give you an idea, we have more, as, at GE, we have more than 8 million operating hours on turbine with some type of uh, hydrogen content in the fuel. So there is still investment to be done, and that's what we are about, investing in technology. But, you know, that's, that's not a bottleneck to the transition. 
And so it, it allows the, the couple renewable and gas allows this acceleration while ensuring the future at net zero or need near zero, uh, as we call it. And um, finally, two other things. It doesn't work if for power gen if there is not the right investment in the grid. And uh, that's also a technology as G that we defend, but the grid needs to be able to absorb this new power, new electrons that will arrive, but also this new type of electrons because renewables is intermittent power ultimately, and that changes the, um, uh, the concept of how the grid needs to operate, including the digitalization of it again. Um, and we as G, how we position ourselves, when you think about Belfort, and it was mentioned here, we have this manufacturing plant that manufacture gas turbine for more than 30 years that serve uh, half of the world from there. This technology has been used by EDF lately uh, to uh, start uh, one of the decarbonization activity, and we see the prospect for a similar technology in all over the GCC. Thank you so much. Uh, that's very impressive. And I think now we, we can move to, to my, my next speaker, who is Amalia uh, Giannakiku. You are the head of development and investment for Europe of Mazdar. Um, so two good reasons to have you now in the row. Uh, one is uh, the incredible success story of Mazda. We used to see it as a local, uh, very dynamic player, and now it's all over the place and including in Europe. And the second is, obviously, yes, the gas turbines uh, could be a good backup and are a good backup in many regions to uh, an increased deployment of renewables. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you, and thank you, everyone. I'll start by addressing what was discussed in the last session. It's not about competition. So it's not about uh, one country competing against the other. It's actually about collaboration and coordination among the countries. So master. It's a relatively new company, 17 years in the sector, very new in renewables, but then again, very dynamic. Uh, we are sitting today with uh, commitments and assets uh, worth of uh, uh, $30 billion. Uh, we're already in 40 different countries, and we have uh, commitments on our operating assets that are um, totaling more than 20 gigawatts. Earlier this year, we made a new announcement, the new master, transforming master, not only to capture um, the renewable, which is our mandate uh, going forward, but we also brought two more Abu Dhabi government entities into our structure. Uh, we're investing through that, and we're supporting very much how we transmit all this green uh, technology, green uh, production, whether these are electrons or these are uh, production of uh, renewable, production of green hydrogen. Uh, so we have uh, uh, TACA and uh, the National uh, Energy Company of uh, the government of Abu Dhabi and we have ADNOC in our structure as well to promote even further that. Master as part of this journey has also made commitments uh, to bring our uh, targeted uh, capacity to five times more in the next six and a half years, so by 2030. This is a major commitment from our side. Uh, we're targeting 100 gigawatts by 2030, and even going beyond that uh, for the years later. We've also made a commitment to invest in green hydrogen, uh, targeting one million tons of uh, green hydrogen by uh, the timeline that I just mentioned. A number of uh, agreements that we've uh, signed during uh, this uh, time, uh, connecting the UAE, connecting uh, the region with Europe, um, uh, both on production. We have uh, uh, made a commitment for the production of uh, 10 gigawatt of renewable projects in, uh, and uh, investments in, uh, in Egypt, and then transmitting that into Europe through collaborations we have on the transmission side, either through MASA or Abu Dhabi government um, initiatives. Um, so it's not only a matter of production, it's also a matter of transmission. I'll also emphasize our interest to uh, see further initiatives on the green hydrogen. Uh, and again, uh, support from the government in the ability to transfer that. 
dedicated uh, uh, pipelines dedicated for green hydrogen so as to feed the um, high uh, demand centers of, of Europe and elsewhere. Thank you, Amalia. And you, you also put the finger on this fundamental issue, which is transmission, which is obviously the, the next big thing we all have to work on, uh, be it in, in the OECD, be it in, the, in Europe, in the United States, uh, in the region, and there's plenty of opportunity of interconnections indeed. Um, may I turn to, to Majdi Abed? You are the Vice President uh, for International uh, Public Affairs of Total Energies, and your company also embodies the transformation of, uh, apart from being an oil major, into a multi energy uh, company operating across the world. Um, how you specifically see uh, the GCC region in terms of opportunities, and, and, and what is it that you have on your radar there? Shukran, Marc Antoine. Um, shukran al-da'wa. Assalamu alaikum. I won't follow in Arabic, uh, I'm sorry, but um, uh, I won't follow in, in uh, English neither because uh, it's better for your ears. So I'm going to speak French, uh, if you don't mind. Put your ears at. Comme, comme, comme tu l'as dit, Marc-Antoine, uh, les pays du Golfe sont essentiels pour la transition énergétique. C'est vraiment euh, le lieu où, à mon sens, l'essentiel va se produire. Pourquoi Parce que dans transition énergétique, il y a transition. Attends, je, je, je vais reprendre. Yes. Donc, je disais que les, les, les pays du Golfe sont essentiels parce que dans transition énergétique, il y a transition. Et la transition, ça demande du temps. Rien n'indique qu'on pourra euh, totalement et rapidement se passer euh, des énergies fossiles. Donc, et on sait tous que euh, les derniers barils euh, viendront vraisemblablement du Golfe. Donc ça va demander du temps et les pays du Golfe ont un rôle à jouer. Dans le même temps, euh, les pays du Golfe ont, et certains d'entre eux plus que d'autres, mais ont des réserves de gaz très importantes. Et le gaz et l'énergie de la transition. Je crois que tout le monde le sait. Euh, si on devait remplacer le charbon par le gaz et toutes les centrales à charbon par des centrales à gaz, on serait dans la trajectoire de 1,5. Donc, euh, il y a là un atout, encore une fois, pour les pays du Golfe à travers euh, le gaz. Et Total Energy, comme vous le savez, est investi dans le développement des champs Northfield au Qatar. Nous sommes également en Arabie Saoudite, aux côtés de Saudi Aramco, euh, pour notre projet de raffinerie et de pétrochimie, Satorp et Amiral. Et euh, nous développons une coopération très forte avec les Émirats, aussi dans d'autres secteurs qui permettent de diminuer l'intensité carbone euh, des énergies fossiles, à travers les technologies que vous connaissez sans doute, qui sont le CCS euh, euh, et le DAC, Direct Air Capture. Donc on a, on a dans cette région euh, tous les potentiels pour développer les choses et, et les, la compagnie Total Energy a une très forte coopération avec, euh, encore une fois, Qatar Energy, Saudi Aramco, Adnoc et tous les partenaires pour euh, réussir cette transition et parvenir à maintenir, comme l'a dit euh, euh, mon camarade de droite, à maintenir le triangle clé qui est euh, à la fois euh, l'accessibilité, il faut que l'énergie soit accessible, il faut qu'elle soit disponible et il faut qu'elle soit durable, accessible en termes financiers. Voilà, je ne vais pas être plus long, parce que je crois que nous avons des consignes. Merci. Merci beaucoup, uh, Majdi. Et, et on va revenir là, notamment sur les enjeux de. Sorry. Thank you very much, Majdi. Now I was <laughs> slipping into French. Uh, but we go back notably to, to carbon capture and storage in a, in a second. But let me uh, introduce now my last speaker, uh, Didier Olo. You are the executive uh, vice president of NG. NG um, is uh, known uh, in Europe and across the world because you have very, very soon embraced a very ambitious decarbonization strategy. You are, your company is certified uh, 
by well below two degrees uh, by uh, the science-based target. Um, and uh, you are operating in a number of sectors, including all the energy services to the energy transition. That is not just electricity supply, but also on the demand side and, and also on the, on the district level pooling system, for example. So perhaps you could tell us a bit more about uh, your experience, uh, your activities there and the opportunities you see uh, in the region. Uh, thank you, Marc-Antoine. Yes, Angie has been very active in the Gulf countries for many years. And uh, traditionally, we were very involved in the gas fire power plants. And I don't come back to what has been already said about the role of these gas fire power plants. I would like to insist more on two or three topics where NG may have a different profile. Uh, the first one is about um, district cooling. You just mentioned it, Marc Antoine. We consider district cooling to be an absolutely major. Uh, development target in the Gulf countries. Um, we all know that producing cool with uh, a normal uh, air conditioning system at home is the most inefficient way to cool your home. And everywhere where you can replace it by a district cooling system, uh, it's far more efficient. First, because uh, apparatus to transform uh, energy into cool is more efficient but also because you can store cold water. And if you store cold water, it means that you can produce the cold when the power is available. And therefore, you bring a solution to the issue of intermittency of uh, photovoltaic power. Because you produce a photovoltaic power, you produce cold water, you store the cold water, and you can use it 24 hours a day. So, Typically, that's the kind of solution we want to develop, and we are one of the main partners of Tabrid with uh, developing uh, this solution across uh, the Gulf countries. Another um, industry in which we are very much involved is uh, desalination. We are operator of several desalination plants. We are currently developing the Mirfa uh, water plant production in, uh, in Abu Dhabi. Uh, and we have great ambitions there. And one day also, you can think that also water production could be made um, variable in the time so that you can store uh, sweet water like you store cold water in a district cooling system and adapt your energy consumption to the energy availability. Because, and that's my third point, um, Managing the demand will become an absolutely major topic for the Gulf countries. Because you have so much development of renewable electricity, you need to be able to adjust the demand on the other side. It's pointless to try to replicate with a very high percentage of renewable electricity the same stable grid that you had enjoyed when all the power production means were stable, gas-fired, coal-fired, whatever. You have to be able to adapt the demand to the availability of power. And that's the next challenge for the Gulf countries. And it's a double challenge. It's a challenge technically, but it's a challenge also on the regulatory point of view. Because in the Gulf country, like in many countries in the world, the regulation has not been drafted for a world where most of the energy is intermittent and therefore you need to uh, find a way to incentivize people to use power when it's available rather than when they think they need it. Um, that being said, uh, obviously another topic will be uh, whatever can adjust offer and demand like batteries in different form. It could be thermal storage, it could be lithium yarn, it could be other technologies, but storage of power and storage of energy will be the next big thing. And obviously, in that respect, hydrogen production is also a way to store energy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Didier. And uh, oh, uh, that's good. I see there is a, a 
people who want to react. So, you know what, we still have a few minutes left. So what I suggest is, uh, I'm, I'm very pleased if you can react, if you wish to react to what's been said, and uh, we can start with Hervé, uh, who was very keen to do so. And perhaps also, let's take this as your final remark. So if you wish also perhaps to highlight one or two projects uh, or ongoing developments you are particularly looking forward this year, which you are very proud about, and, and you think are game changers, please, uh, please go uh, ahead and outline them. Uh, Hervé, st we start with you. Uh, yes, thank, thank you, Marc-Antoine. Thank you very much. I would like to, uh, I find this panel very interesting because we are talking about very complementary questions. You know, uh, there are the question of transition and the question of long term. If we talk about nuclear, I will put it on the long term, but if you take uh, the Baraka power station, it will operate till the end of this century till uh, 20, uh, 2100. Uh, if we, when uh, Egypt will have started uh, also the, I'll, uh, I forgot the name, the, the power plant, the nuclear power plant, it will also operate uh, till, the, till the beginning of the next century. And so uh, I will do the, the I will uh, make the link between the transition. I will agree, agree that we will need all type of technology, storage, gas, and so on, to do transition with a lower carbon emission. And for the long term, this is my personal opinion, we will need some long-term energy like nuclear, and nuclear for electricity, nuclear for uh, maybe cooling uh, with uh, steam, uh, um, heating for industrial needs, uh, heating for uh, houses, and so on. It's not going directly and always through electricity. And if I, we, uh, I want to answer to your question, is what I am proud of is the uh, success of uh, the e-fusion uh, approach that we have with the Emirates and the very impressive results of the Baraka nuclear power plants. Uh, we are not responsible of this, but uh, they have done a, a tremendous job. Thank you, Enver. And, and, and yes, indeed, I mean, I mentioned as a bottleneck the great issue, but, uh, but the skills is also uh, 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 an issue for the, the entire world. Uh, as we want to deploy uh, these technologies at scale. Uh, Nabil, would you perhaps uh, 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 tell us also a bit more uh, on, on your perspective on carbon capture and storage, where uh, your company seems to put a lot of emphasis on? Yeah, uh, Aramco strongly believe in uh, really taking the uh, strong steps and really identifying uh, solutions for the complex climate change. Uh, so the carbon capture and sequestration project that Aramco launched, uh, and it will be the basis for also expanding how many tons of CO2 will be captured. So we're starting with 9 million tons uh, per year by 2027, which is quite sizable. I think it will be probably um, among if, if not the largest uh, carbon capture sequestration. It will uh, play a major role in also attracting technologies, uh, identifying areas of how do you really cut cost how do you leverage technology to solve this very complex, uh, very complex problem? Uh, one area that I would like also to talk about uh, is the role of digitalization, the role of collecting data, uh, the role of you know, machines uh, supporting human beings uh, that are beyond the human capacity. So when you talk about as simple as carbon ca capture or sequestration, uh, there, are, there is a role for digitalization, specifically you know, data and AI, to support, help us uh, in, in uh, making better decisions. When you store uh, CO2, uh, you, know, you need to monitor the performance of the storage. You need to identify you know, if there are any uh, you know, issues related to the operation. So we need to bring digitalization early on, and this is what Aramco is doing, even with the cup carbon capture and sequestration, because it will give us a record uh, how, what, which areas we can, you know, take, uh, you know, the carbon capture sequ sequestration projects to the next level. So modeling, even bringing quantum computing into, into the modeling and computation. So we, we like to uh, always, whenever there is a, a global initiative like carbon capture sequestration, we invite know the technology people to come and participate with us and and we have a, a major plan for digitalization to play a role 
in uh, projects such as the uh, CCUS uh, project in Saudi Arabia. Thank you, Nabil, and, and thanks also for reminding that we are not talking about energy transitions. They go in pair with the digital transition, of course, and, and they're both helping each other, and there is no way to do this in silo, of course. Absolutely. Can I, can I uh, turn to, uh, to Brice? Uh, uh, perhaps tell us, um, you know, what is exactly that you're also eyeing in the GCC region this year, and maybe also with all these deployment gas-fired power plants and more renewables, so do you see that maybe there will be actually more capacity available, but less utilization possibly of these plants, hence also some regulatory developments to be, to be made? Yeah, so, so first of all, I agree that all of that is complementary to what Hervé also mentioned. Ultimately, there is a point that we hear about that, but we need to act now. So also to focus what are we focusing on, but if we don't act now, and we will not move the needle. To act now, it's about where the money goes. So where this investment will go. With all, all the technologies that have been explained and uh, what we are focusing on, on power gen. On power gen, some things are very fast. We look at, in Abu Dhabi, to upgrade existing plant. This is CO2 emission reduction in six, six months from now. We look at moving, um, you know, simple cycle plant to combined cycle plant. So that would mean adding steam turbine on an existing plant. This is one and a half year from now, 30% reduction of emission of CO2. We are following up on what we did uh, in Charger for uh, more than 1.2 gigawatt of power from Belfort. That came from the factory here in France. This is compared to the previous technology for similar power generation. This is four million tons per year of CO2 reduction. To give you an idea, this is about one million car out of the road uh, equivalent. So that's the type of thing we are doing. We see that GCC is looking the same. Saudi is looking at a huge, huge investment on renewables and uh, gas in which we hope to participate. Again, with the support from the Belfort Engineering. Um, and uh, finally, it, the future for us will look different because even though the technology will be there, they won't be used the same way. That's what uh, you mentioned, meaning they will probably will use less than today with renewable providing most of the power to the grid, but this technology providing power whenever renewable is not able to. And that requires to make sure that the regulation is in place to make sure the investment are happening around such scheme of technology. And of course, this is a debate and the discussion we are having with all the partners. Thank you, Brice. And um, Amalia, I think we were all uh, flabbergasted by your impressive targets to 2030 because we in Europe discuss also these ramp up of renewables targets, but uh, I think nobody dares to, to, to bet on that, that will succeed. But how do you move from 20 to 100 gigawatts uh, within such a short time frame? And what makes you confident you can deliver on that? Uh, and uh, uh, I'd be happy to hear you on that, notably. Uh, quite a few things so that I want to address in yeah, this sure. last uh, statement, uh, but uh, we are planning to do that through collaborations, as stated earlier. So most of the companies that are seated here, if not uh, many more, we are always believing in uh, walking this path together with others. Um, we're investing in renewables, naturally, wind farms, solar farms, onshore, offshore, waste to energy, energy efficiency, battery storage. We acquired uh, Arlington Energy uh, late uh, in uh, last year. Um, a number of things that we do, both also on the off-grid uh, system, so a lot of projects that Master invests in uh, to support um, local communities. But I will touch a bit on what my colleague here uh, said earlier. It's all about demand as well. And I'll link it to what I want to also mention, which is about education. It's about educating our young, uh, uh, you know, uh, students uh, to actually change their mindsets and move towards a more sustainable uh, economy and more sustainable energy uh, and the transition that we're working towards that. We as the UAE have made all these commitments as master. Uh, we're also one of the first, if not the first country that signed off the Paris Agreement a few years ago. Uh, we are 
through our presidency of um, of Mazda also have the presidency of uh, COP28 in the UAE. Uh, that shows the very solid commitment that we have in this uh, transition to bring as many renewable energy projects as we can. Uh, this is in also committing to a, a zero carbon uh, energy uh, by 2050. Um, as, as, a, as a UAE, and again, we are not going to do that alone. We, we need support, we need support from the governments, we need support from all our colleagues or competitors. This is uh, doing things together, not, uh, not differently. Thank you, Amalia, and also, of course, for reminding us of uh, COP28, which everybody's looking forward to when we just had and are having the discussions in Bonn, the preparatory discussions, of course, which take uh, quite a few days, but uh, which will give us an indication of where to go. But definitely uh, um, that will be the, the most important uh, uh, gathering uh, early December in Dubai. Um, can I turn to, to Majdi? Perhaps, uh, Majdi, uh, what is also remarkable about Total Energy is, is that you are one of, or if not the only oil major, that has also a footprint in the battery industry. And, uh, and that might be very interesting also for us and, and also for the region, because the region it was also very interested in moving up the automotive value chain. And, and we're also happy to hear any comments you would like to make about uh, our discussion. Merci. Euh, tout d'abord, je, je, je voudrais reprendre ou réagir sur ce qu'a dit Amalia sur euh, l'importance de la pédagogie, sur l'importance de, de bien expliquer les choses. Et, et je crois qu'il faut aussi le faire, comme on l'a dit, pour euh, bien expliquer qu'on ne peut pas passer d'un système euh, à base d'énergie fossile, carbonée, à un système à base d'énergie décarbonée euh, du jour au lendemain. Ça, encore une fois, c'est quelque chose d'important et ce n'est pas toujours entendu. Pour autant, j'ai bien conscience, tout le monde a bien conscience qu'il faut accélérer. Et Total Energy le fait, puisqu'on passe de 4 milliards d'investissements en 2022 à 5 milliards dans les énergies low carbone et, et qu'on déploie tout ce qu'il est possible de déployer pour atteindre les objectifs. Et nous avons également l'objectif de 100 gigawatts pour 2030. Donc, euh, il faut accélérer. Ça, c'est évident. Il y a plusieurs manières de le faire. Donc, j'ai parlé des investissements, euh, comme Brice l'a soulevé. Il y a plusieurs manières de le faire. Le CCS, euh, US, euh, l'efficacité énergétique, euh, l'hydrogène, euh, les euh, énergies euh, photovoltaïques, éoliennes. Donc, il y, a, il, y a, il y a toute une palette. Et je suis d'accord avec, avec tout le monde. Effectivement, euh, c'est complémentaire. On n'a pas encore une vision assez claire. S'agissant des énergies renouvelables, euh, alternatives, euh, les batteries jouent un rôle clé. Euh, et c'est pour ça que nous, nous avons investi dans les batteries, car elles permettent de stocker cette énergie et de la redéployer au meilleur moment. Donc, euh, donc voilà. Et s'agissant des projets un peu, un peu phares, que, que nous avons, euh, il y a évidemment euh, cette centrale solaire d'El Carsa euh, de, de 800 MW qui, euh, sur sa durée de vie, permettra d'économiser 20 millions de tonnes de CO2, 26 millions de tonnes de CO2. Il y a euh, un gros projet que nous avons, euh, c'est dans le Golfe, même si ce n'est pas le, dans le cadre du Conseil de coopération des États du Golfe, en, en Irak. Euh, d'un 1 gigawatt 2. Euh, il y a, je l'espère, euh, beaucoup d'autres opportunités euh, dans le solaire, dans l'éolien, dans, dans, dans toutes les énergies bas carbone euh, avec tous nos partenaires dans les pays du Golfe. Merci beaucoup, Majdi. Oh, uh, Nabil, would you like to jump in quickly? Yeah, I would like quickly. to, very yes. quickly. Uh, you know, something that we typically don't talk about is, uh, which was addressed by, by, is the dispatchability of the energy mix. Huh? So I think it, sometimes we talk about uh, switching energy transition, but there is operation. When you operate uh, an electricity grid, you cannot uh, nuclear switch it on and off. This is like a base load that will have to stay with you more than 8,000 hours probably uh, a year. 
but there is this swing, you know, uh, that you need to switch on and off in order to operate your grid very, uh, very securely and in reliable uh, format. So, so thinking of the dispatchability in an energy mix is something very, very critical and very important, you know, for the, as you start the energy security, especially for the electricity uh, grid. So some of the, uh, you know, people, they might think that, you know, renewable can displace the conventional energy or even nuclear can do it. You have to need an operator, and we work in, in Saudi Arabia with the operator to understand what is really the right energy mix to have to dispatch between different forms of energy, which is very, very important for the energy security, for making sure that this society, whether, you know, business or the people have access to secure energy. And I thought from the discussions, you know, that this is an area that we don't talk about this, but thank you for bringing this, because this is very important, dispatchability, how do you re-switch? And, and I'm sure Europe probably struggled huh? uh, a certain uh, period of time because of, you know, missing this uh, dispatchability uh, issue, which is combined with the energy mix of any country. Just a moment, if you me autorize. Uh, il y a un sujet dont on n'a pas parlé, et, et, il me semble, et, et qui est important, c'est la lutte contre euh, les, le méthane. Et, 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 et là-dessus aussi, nous sommes pleinement mobilisés pour euh, réduire euh, la quantité de méthane à travers la lutte contre le, le torchage, la suppression du torchage. Et, et on, on a des objectifs euh, euh, ambitieux, puisqu'on veut, on veut diminuer euh, les émissions de méthane de 50% en, en 2025 par rapport à 2020 et 80% en 2030. Je crois que la lutte contre les émissions de méthane est aussi euh, un des moyens euh, de, de tenir nos engagements euh, en termes de gaz à effet de serre. Merci, yeah, thank you Majdi for reminding us. Yes, if we put more gas in the system, it has to be clean, spick and spam value chains indeed with no venting and flaring and, uh, and and by the way it's not just the oil and gas industry, it's also the coal in the, the coal mines, it's also the waste sector, etc. Let me turn to uh, our last speaker uh, today, uh, Didier Olo. You, so you have basically a chance to react. Uh, there's lots of great projects going on. What is fascinating is in Europe, we tend to look at smaller projects. The, the, your region is a region of <laughs> plenty. And so the scale is just always impressive. So perhaps you could also uh, react on that and, and leave us with a final word uh, before we conclude. Um, thank you, Marc-Antoine. Um, Yes, uh, this is a region where a lot of big projects are being considered, and I will speak uh, later of one of them. But I would start by jumping on what Brice said, that energy efficiency is absolutely essential, and this is done by many, many small projects on existing installation. And because there are so many small projects, at the end, it represents an energy savings which is absolutely massive. And um, NG with its NG solution global business unit is able to uh, help deliver these massive savings. It starts with very basic things like replacing traditional bulbs by lead in public lighting in, uh, in Abu Dhabi. Uh, but it may be in uh, many other places I already mentioned uh, district cooling, which is far more efficient, let's say twice more efficient than individual air conditioning uh, systems. So we need to improve that. Uh, I will not come back to what Brie said about power plants, gas fire power plants, where a lot can be done, but a lot of industrial plants can be done more efficient, and des desalination is one of them. And uh, clearly, we need to implement that. It's less visible, less big projects, but a lot of small investments, small decisions by many decision makers, and it will make a big difference. So that's very important, and NG can help its customer in, uh, in doing so. The second thing is, yes, we are also involved in big projects. I will just mention one of them. Uh, bouncing on what Amalia said about partnership and partnership with Mazda, in this case, 18 months ago, our CEO, Kenry McGregor, signed with uh, His Excellency Sultan Al-Jaber 
memorandum of understanding about a big project, which is Crystal Green High H2 project, where we want to implement two gigawatt of, uh, of solar panel plus electrolyzer. It's a five billion USD uh, project, and uh, it's progressing quite well. We expect to be able to make final investment decision by the time of COP28, and that would be uh, clearly a landmark. We strongly believe that hydrogen is part of the future of energy all over the world, but particularly in this region where uh, cheap green power is available. And uh, we are working on that. That's one of our flagship projects in this region. And we strongly believe that with this project, we will be able, as a uh, Amalia mentioned not only to produce for the local industry, but obviously to transport and export hydrogen. Thank you, Didier. I think we had a, a wonderful panel. Uh, we are running already late, but we still managed to do that in 45 minutes. Maybe just a one word to wrap this up. I think uh, it was indeed very complimentary, but at the end of the day, we spoke all a lot about electricity, about electrification, and we should not underestimate how much more electricity we will need for the carbon capture and storage, for the hydrogen, for the uh, district heating, cooling, and, and you name it, and you name it. And so the priority, and let me formulate that wish, is really to accelerate the decarbonization of electricity, the ramp up of new capacity, the flexibility. And I think what was remarkable is that we managed to bring in the, the demand side. Very often everything is addressed from a supply side perspective, but the demand side matters equally because if we want to achieve these transitions in plural, uh, the mind side will, of course, play a fundamental role. So what was also remarkable is that we heard a lot of uh, uh, calls for collaboration and actually examples of many concrete things that are going on. So that, I think, is very promising. I think it really makes the case for this uh, meeting today, for this gathering today. And let us all, uh, all thank our panelists and wish also uh, to the UAE and to His Excellency uh, Sultan Al-Jaber a, a very successful COP. At least everybody here on this, in this uh, table is committed to, to working towards that success. So thank you all and, and an applause for our speakers. Thank you.